Hello. You're probably wondering why the delay, also why the pearls and why the handbag. So let me start with the pearls. A lot of pearls. One thing to remember about this talk is the pearls. So I want to tell you about pearls because pearls have a dirty secret. They have grit in their hearts. And I want to use pearls as a metaphor for my talk today. If you're from Scotland, you don't say pearls, you say perils. And I think pearls and peril go together. It takes two to tango. Because if you think about how a pearl is created, it's created through peril. The oyster thinks it's about to be invaded by an irritant. So it covers it with nacre in order to protect itself. So this beauty is hard won, and that's the theme of my talk. I'm Eve Poole, and I'm going to talk to you about leader smithing. And to do that, I need some props, hence the handbag. The first prop is a tiara. <laughs> now, I wonder how many of you are aficionados of the Princess Diaries. Well, I love the Princess Diaries, and here's some Disney wisdom for you. You may remember the plot. Uh, this young lady has just discovered she's about to uh, inherit the throne. And she's having a bit of a trauma in San Francisco in the rain in a car park about this. And luckily, her now dead father had the foresight to write her a letter before he died, giving her some life wisdom. And in it, there is this brilliant line. And the line is, the one thing you have to remember is that there are some things that are more important than fear. Isn't that brilliant? There are some things that are more important than fear. And I wonder what you fear. I wonder if you fear coming and doing a talk like this, whatever else you might fear in your life. I want to talk to you about how we can understand more about how people really learn leading and how we can conquer our fears to be better leaders. So I want to take you through a story that will involve some talking about the brain and some talking about how we know how people learn and templating in the brain. And I want to talk to you about smithing and apprentice pieces. So I'll need some more props for that. The first prop is the good book. I'm a theology graduate from Durham, after all. So let me read you a bit from St. Paul. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope will not disappoint us. Is that reminding you of the pearls yet? It takes two to tango. You can't have the beauty of these pearls without the grit at their heart. So I work for Ashish Business School, where I've been teaching leadership for about 10 years now. And I am curious about what it is that stops people being courageous leaders. So I decided to find out. So I went to ask a whole load of board level leaders what it is they know now that they wish they'd known 10 years ago. So I thought that might give us some insight in what it is we need to know now to be job ready for these roles in the future. And I did this because of another story. I don't know if you know your Arthurian law, but there's a lovely story about when Arthur and Merlin meet for the first time. So Arthur is wandering around the woods, and he meets this old man, this wizard. And he goes to the wizard's hut, and he finds breakfast has already been laid out for them. And he's very puzzled, and they have this conversation where he says to Merlin, why were you expecting me? How did you know I was coming? And he says, well, you were born at the beginning of time, and you're living your life forward. But I was born at the end of time, and I'm living my life backwards. So of course I knew to expect you, because you've already been. And I love that idea of 2020 hindsight and 2020 foresight. And I thought that's what we really want, to help people be more courageous. Because if you know what is coming, if you know what to expect, then you don't fear it. So I set about turning all the findings from this research we'd done into what leaders wish they'd known 10 years ago into a simulation. And we invited people to come on our courses and go through some of these pivotal experiences that leaders had told them they had learned so much from, and so they could devise some kind of muscle memory, some templates, some 2020 foresight for the future. And it was working really quite well, but we wanted to know why. So we had to get into the neurobiology of how leaders learn and what's going on. So I have a couple of props for you here. One is a brain. Put that here. And one is an almond. So this, often the brain is described as a walnut, isn't it? It looks like walnutty exterior. And I want to talk to you about how these two things relate. 
So if any of you, many of you being here at Durham at the moment, will know that we're very interested in your cognitive functioning. And we're very cerebral at Durham, trying to make sure that you are thinking all the right thoughts to the right quality in order to get that first and that fabulous degree. And a lot of leadership development has been like that. We've rode, put people in rows and we've taught them all kinds of amazing things about strategy and role model leaders of your, and we've told them that all they need to do is learn a few two-by-two two matrices and they'll be fine in any situation. And it has all been a bit too cerebral, I think, because most leaders I meet don't have the luxury of time to be able to pop off into their room and Google some Harvard Business Review article about what they should do next. Most leadership happens when everything has suddenly gone horribly wrong. You're standing there being frightfully grand and grown up and important with your brilliant corner office and fabulous car. And they all come running into you saying, boss, boss, what do we do? What do we do? And you're supposed to stand there looking frightfully gravitasy and go, well, clearly the answer is 42. And everyone's supposed to applaud and elect you prime minister immediately. But of course, most of the time, you're sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do. And most leaders I know feel they have imposter syndrome. They feel they're about to be found out. So what are we doing when all we're doing is populating this, when this isn't going to be the thing that's going to be in charge when leaders are really having to show up and lead? In fact, what is going to be in charge at that point is this Armand. Not actually this Armand, but let me explain. So Armand, those of you who are classicists in the room may know that um, Armand, the Greek for Armand, is amygdala. And right in the heart of this, at the top of your spine, the base of your skull, you have a piece of your brain called the amygdala. Now, they think we probably hung on to this from when we were reptiles, because reptiles are pretty successful, aren't they? I mean, apart from bacteria, they are the species who have managed to survive the longest. So when we evolved our brilliant mammalian brain, we kept this at its heart, at its core. And those of you who like movies may remember recently there was this brilliant movie called Inside Out, which was all about what's going on in your head. Uh, and it explained very beautifully the difference between this bit and this bit. Because you might remember at the end of each day, Riley's memories got filed, and the really humdinger emotional ones got sort of tagged with the right emotion and put into memory central, into core memories. And that's what happens in your brain. You have all the things that have ever happened to you here, and a particular repository for those memories that are particularly emotionally salient, because they may be necessary for your survival in the future. So this normally is fine, because we have this great filing cabinet here people who've got PhDs from Durham in filing. Uh, and you know we've got some good stuff in here too. But you're only really as good as the templates you've got in here. So let me give you an example of that. Because what tends to happen under pressure is that your, the chemicals in your body tell your amygdala it's in charge, not your neocortex. So it takes over. It becomes your pilot in times of peril. So let me give you an example of when something happened to me that made me notice these two bits of my brain and how they weren't always matching up. So you heard from the introduction that I um, have a degree from here, a theology degree here, and an MBA from Edinburgh, after which I went to be a consultant for Deloitte. And I was fabulous. I had a pinstripe suit. I had cufflinks. I had a laptop in the days when they were frightfully rare. I even had one of these enormous mobile phones back in the day. Uh, and I was brilliant. I was absolutely brilliant. So I was busy being brilliant. And we were working for a client in Mayfair, which is also quite brilliant. Uh, and I was trotting around the office being brilliant. And we'd set up this gig for the, this client. Uh, and an email had gone out about it in which there had been an error. And the boss had discovered this error and had been <coughs> hopping mad about it. So he'd phoned up the uh, American global head of Deloitte to complain about this secretarial oversight that I had committed. And unfortunately, being in America, he was on a different time zone, so he didn't pick up, which didn't improve his temper. So he then decided he was going to phone the UK head of Deloitte to complain to him. And he was also on voicemail, which didn't improve this guy's temper. Then he phoned the audit partner, who was also on voicemail, didn't improve his temper. And then he saw my mobile phone number. So he phoned me. I was going, hello, Eve Poole, Deloitte Consulting. Smug, smug, smug. And all of a sudden down the phone, I just heard this vitriol. I heard this shouting in words I can't possibly say in this talk. And all I wanted to do was pee. So I was standing there <laughs> in the middle of the office, clutching my enormous phone panicking, thinking, I need the loo, I need the loo, I need the loo. So I managed to sort of pass the phone to someone way above my pay grade uh, and ran down the corridor to have a reflect and learn on uh, what had happened to me there. Uh, and I realized that what was happening, that because this shouting and the swearing had made my body think it was in peril, my amygdala had taken over. And my amygdala had gone busy around my head trying to find a template to tell me what to do. And the only template it managed to find was a template from when I was three years old. 
So I was brought up in Fife in Scotland in a very normal kind of 1970s background uh, where girls are girls. You know, we wear dresses and have blonde hair and trot around. And uh, I had uh, been in the garden one day. My father had come out uh, because he discovered um, an accident with a, a piece of family china, a small, a, 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 a piece smashed by a falling jam jar. And clearly, it was my fault. So he'd come out to the garden to find me. Uh, I was trotting around the sand pit. And he came over, roaring away at me, telling me off about this desperate thing. And of course, when you're three, what is a really top strategy if your dad's shouting at you and you want him to go away? Because if you wet yourself, we'll go, ah, oh, get your mother. And then he leaves you to it. Brilliant, brilliant. So really good strategy when you're three. Not a really very good strategy when you're 30. Frankly, a bit career limiting, I'd say. So when I had a look at it, I thought, well, crikey, what is happening between the age of three and 30 that I have nothing in there, that I have an empty filing cabinet in my amygdala? And it was because being that nice five 1970s girly, it hadn't been really encouraged that I should you know, incur the wrath of chaps in particular. No wrath at all, actually, but particularly not from chaps. Uh, so actually, I had nothing really between the age of three and 30 of chaps shouting at me. So I then decided what I needed to do was have an experiment, which was my picking fights with chaps experiment. So I spent a whole year gently picking fights with chaps. So hitherto, I'd be sitting in meetings, and someone would say something clearly otis, and I'd kind of go, ha ha, and that's the way that girls do when they're feeling a bit like, oh, God. Um, so I thought I'd up my game and go passive-aggressive writing down a stupid remark, uh, and then sort of raising my game, saying, can you repeat that? Uh, and can you repeat that? And sort of raising my game until finally I was saying, what's your evidence for that? I'm not sure I agree with you. So I got quite good at it, and I wasn't sure. Acid test came up later when I was in the car park of the Birkenstead Chinese takeaway, and the phone rang. I was one of my colleagues from Ashridge, and he was ranting. And I stood there with the phone, smaller phone, 10 years old, uh, you know, down in my ear, and um, rant, rant, rant. And actually, I felt fine. Nothing going on at all. Uh, all I could hear was sort of voices in my head saying, don't panic, just let him talk. He's really cross, just listen, just go, mm, active listening, you know, he'd been on the course. Um, so it was great, and I felt totally calm and fine. And I thought, gosh, it hasn't actually taken me very long with my picking fights with chaps experiment of the year to just start replacing templates through. So I want to talk to you about why I think that's really important for all of us, because it does talk right into this idea about your fears. So if you think about it, um, what we're trying to do in understanding the difference between your neocortex and your amygdala is trying to understand what kinds of templates do you need that would stop you being scared of things. Because then under pressure, you would feel resource to cope. So my first string of pearls I inherited from my great-grandmother, who was brought up at Hampton Court Palace. Uh, and my second string of pearls was a present from my husband when I worked at Deloitte, because her garden was just over the road. My third string of pearls I got in Beijing when I took the MBA students out on a tour. And the third string of pearls aren't real pearls. They're simulated pearls. And I don't know if you know how to make pearls, but what you do with these sorts of pearls is you inject a bead into the oyster. So slightly bigger than just a speck of dust. But it's enough to trigger that immune response from the oyster to cover it in nacre so that you get something that looks remarkably similar to the first string of pearls, the real ones. And that's really where we're going with this. It's a bit like trying to, you're on Strictly and you've drawn the tango and you kind of know how to do the tango. You sort of taught your body how to do the tango, but you don't really know how it's going to be on the day. You don't quite know how your nerves will be, what the particular crowd will be, if your partner will be as reliable as you have been in rehearsal. But what you do is you rehearse enough to know that there's not very much of a gap between your technical talent and what you might need on the day to do through adrenaline. I don't know how many of you know um, your actors, but Laurence Olivier was apparently desperately, desperately stayed and suffered from stage fright. And he used to be puking into buckets in the wings before he went on. Uh, and he was once interviewed about this, and they said, well, how do you manage? Because, you know, you're a very famous actor, but you seem to be absolutely paralyzed by stage fright. And he said, well, I send on Mr. Technique, and I hope to follow him later. And I'm really interested in how we can actually just schedule in our fears so that we design them out of our lives. Because what we know is that there are certain things you need to be able to do to get on in life whether it's for a particular leadership role or a particular career that you have in mind. And there are probably some things that are stopping you moving towards that because you're terrified. And what we know from the neurobiology is if you just start practicing, a bit like my picking fights with chaps, you will start building resilience to be able to keep going. 
So you may have heard um, all of these stories in the papers about hysterical strength when grannies lift tractors off toddlers, uh, because they can. Uh, and there's no particular reason that they should be able to, which is why it's called hysterical strength. And it's a bit like that in your head. You'll have heard about fight or flight. It's actually fight then flight, because you have to optimize to assess the threat before you decide whether you're going to fight or flight. Um, and what happens then is your brain makes a decision about whether you're resourced to cope. And in the case of these grannies lifting you know, trucks off babies, they do feel resourced to cope, even though technically they shouldn't be able to. So you don't even necessarily have to know that you can do something. You just need to believe psychologically you might be able to. So my invitation to you is to start thinking about some of the things that you fear and just scheduling them in, scheduling in little practices and little templates to give you the muscle memory to know, a bit like the simulated pearl, that you're not that far off. So I've called the talk Leader Smithing because I was sitting at my sister's wedding and she was marrying a man called Mr. Smith and she was a bit worried that everyone thought, you marry a man called Smith, what's that about? Um, so she did this brilliant speech about how fabulous the name Smith is and it was quoting from Chesterton and all this stuff. And I sat there thinking, you know, Smithing is exactly what we mean. Leadership sounds a very sort of static concept. But actually, wherever you're leading, whatever your realm is, what you are doing is you are being crafty about it. You are having to hone your skills towards mastery day in, day out. It's not just a button that gets pressed. It's those daily occurrences where you see something happening and you have to respond well to it um, so that people can follow your lead. And I have uh, my last exhibit to show you before we finish, which is um, a miniature font. Um, it's actually a Cadgeworth font, and it's from the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall. And those of you who are studying geology will know the only place you find this sort of marble serpentine in the UK is the Lizard Peninsula. You can just dig in your garden and it's right there. And the tradition was that if you wanted to work this particular stone, you would go down and be apprenticed to a stonemason in the Cadgeworth Peninsula, in the Lizard Peninsula in Cadgeworth. And after seven years of apprenticeship, you would be able to graduate. And you did that by producing an apprentice piece to show you and your master and the rest of the guild that you were job ready for the big stuff. So you did something perfectly in miniature. And I'd really like to encourage you all to think about what you could start doing perfectly in miniature that would just start the baby steps towards conquering the fears that you have, all the things that are holding you back from the life that you want and the person that you want to be. Because if you think about it, you can't have the pearls without the peril. And if you think about it, my tiara back on. If you think about the world we're in at the moment, there are a lot of things that are way more important than fear. So good luck with your leadersmithing. <laughs>